Hello, I'm JW. This time we're going to have a look at the EICR, or the Electrical Installation Condition Report. And this one is used where you would be inspecting and testing an existing installation, and is not used where you've just installed or altered something. That's the uh, certificates we've looked at in the previous videos. So this is purely a case of uh, going somewhere that's already got a load of stuff installed, and then inspecting it and doing tests as required. And then basically what you're writing down is the results of those. Now, just as with the other certificates, you can find model examples in the regulations, which is this uh, yellow book here. But say you wouldn't normally use these for an actual one, you'd generally go and buy a pad or buy software or whatever else. But these generally give an idea of what's contained on those. So what I've got here is just basically a copy of what's uh, inside there. And uh, this one comes in several parts. So we have the first page here and the second page, which essentially are just the basic information about the type of installation we've got. And a lot of this is the same as on the electrical installation certificate. And again, it's the uh, characteristics of the installation and the various persons involved and who it's for. And then we've got this section here, which is basically, if anything, which is observed to not comply with the regulations. And then you would just list those in here with codes as appropriate. Then we have these two pages here which are basically a checklist of various things which need to be inspected and it's broken down into various sections and again we'll look at that uh, in more detail in a moment and then the final part is the actual test results and this is actually the same as on the other certificate as well so again, it's just a question of the various circuits the description and test results for each one and so that's the same one you'd use on the electrical installation certificate so a lot of this is similar to the installation certificate, but the main difference is you've got a whole load of stuff to be inspected here. And of course you're not actually reporting on something you've just installed, you're basically reporting on what's there. Most likely been done by somebody else and it could have been a very long time ago. Now of the documents there, the actual test results is exactly the same as we'd used with the electrical installation certificate. So we're not going to cover that in this particular video. But suffice to say it's the same, it's just the list of the circuits here. And then of course the various test results completed there as required. So uh, have a look in the other video for uh, filling that one in, because so that is literally the exact same item. Now for the actual two report pages themselves, a lot of this is also the same as on the installation certificate, specifically on the second page here where we've got the specifics of the particular installation, so things like the earthing arrangement and the type of supply and the voltage and so on. So uh, this particular section here again is pretty much identical to you do on an installation certificate. And again, all this information is obtained via the actual say, type of earthing and so on. So again, we're not going to cover that in this particular video because again, we've already covered that on the installation certificate video, which was done some weeks ago. So we'll have a look at the uh, first page of this, and a lot of this is fairly common sense and pretty straightforward, so we'll just uh, quickly fill some of this in. Now, uh, section A here is details of the client or person ordering the report, so whoever that is, and of course the address and name in there. And that doesn't have to be the exact same place as the report's being done, because you've got a separate section here, for details of where the actual installation is located. Now, of course, they can be the same, but of course, in many cases, the person wanting the report is not actually going to be living at the address in question. So the person for this particular report is Professor F. J. Lewis of All Souls College, Oxford. And in this case, we're going to say that the installation is at a different address, in this case, 38 Edith Road, Purley. Now, uh, section B here is the reason for producing the report, and this can be a variety of different options. In this case, we're going to put down that it was for a uh, safety check, basically to make sure it's still uh, serviceable and not going to start killing people. Again, you can have various different reasons in there, but uh, safety check is what we're going to have for this particular example. And for the type of premises, again, fairly obvious stuff here. We've got domestic, so places where people live. Commercial, so there'll be like offices and shops and things, and industrial sort of factories and the like. And you can have other, because of course there are things that don't necessarily fall into those three categories. In this case, we're going to go for domestic, and other could include things like hospitals and things like that, which aren't really any of those. And uh, estimated age of the wiring system. So again, this is what's already installed and in existence, and uh, you may have documents to support that, but uh, in many cases it's going to be some kind of estimation, as it says there. Evidence of alterations and additions. Yes, if there's obviously things which have been added since the original installation. 
You'd only select no if you know for certain that what was installed, however long ago it was, is all that's there and nothing has ever been added or altered. That's a fairly unlikely one. Not apparent is quite a likely choice as well because uh, bearing in mind that there's not likely to be a huge amount of documents for a lot of installations, so there may have been or there may not, but uh, not apparent, of course, could imply that there's stuff that uh, you haven't seen. And uh, it's in often the case there is, and if there are additions, then how long ago were they done? So in this case, to say probably about five years ago. Now, if you've got documents from the previous things, such as the installation certificate and minor work certificates and things done since then, of course you can just refer to those and uh, fill in the details. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, there are no documents available, and uh, of course they're either never existed or were lost or thrown away long ago, so it is going to be some sort of estimate. And you can usually get a decent idea of, say, the type and style of wiring. A lot of wiring actually has the uh, production date stamped along the side of it. And things like what type of sockets and switches are fitted and the style of them gives you some indication of the age of those. And installation records available. Again, they should always be available, but in many cases, of course, they're not. So they don't necessarily keep those or may not have ever existed. Now, date of last inspection, you can, of course, get that from the uh, installation records, so previous certificates and the like. If they're not available, there should be a label on the consumer unit which uh, states the date of last inspection, in which case just uh, put in the date there. But as with the rest of this, in many cases there's no information given, so again you're just going to have to assume that uh, it hasn't been inspected basically since it was installed, so again you would install the appropriate date inside there. So in this case we'll just put uh, unknown, because obviously you don't actually know, then you can't go making up information. Now section D is essentially what is covered by this report, and this can be the entire installation within a building, or it could be just, say, certain circuits or certain parts of those. So again, it's just describing uh, what was actually covered. And uh, we could put in here, for example, all fixed wiring. Again, on very large installations, say commercial industrial ones, it may be that you're just going to do a selection of some of the circuits or some of the distribution boards or whatever. So again, just detail in there as appropriate. And uh, in addition to this, you can also have various limitations here meaning you're not necessarily going to inspect and test every single item within the installation, because that would be extremely time-consuming and probably not particularly relevant. So again, you can detail here anything you're not going to be inspecting, and again, the reasons why that is, say maybe it wasn't required or it's not particularly practical to get to certain areas, and in certainly in, say, industrial-type environments, it may not be appropriate just to disconnect the entire installation from the power for several hours or days while all this stuff is done. So you may only do uh, certain types of testing, and again, for the inspection side, you may only inspect, say, 25% of the socket outlets, for example. It all depends on the individual circumstances, so again, you just fill in those as appropriate. And agreed with would normally be the person who's ordering the report, but again, you put their name in there, and of course, uh, that often would be the same as the person actually requesting the report. The section here about the inspection and testing and uh, detail in the report has been carried out in accordance with BS7671-2008. And the as amended to is what we've seen in the other video there with the installation certificate. This is just the particular set of regulations you're using at the time. For this particular one it will be the 2015 amendment. And as we saw in the other video, just because this is the amendment 3, which of course was in 2015. So just filling in the appropriate one there. Now this is important because, uh, of course, regulations do change over time, so uh, what may have complied in the past may not comply anymore, so we do need the date in there to indicate what we're actually referring to. Now the bottom bits here, you would normally fill these in after you've done all of the inspection and testing, and here we've got a summary of the condition of the installation, so general condition of it in terms of electrical safety, a very short description there, and then you can put in here satisfactory or unsatisfactory, and depending on the outcome of the rest of the report. And as we've got here, an unsatisfactory assessment indicates that dangerous and or potentially dangerous conditions have been identified, and that's given the codes C1 and C2, which we'll see later on. And recommendations here, again, got feet in from this section here, so that uh, if the uh, items here are stated unsatisfactory, and then, uh, of course, anything like C1 or C2, dangerous or potentially dangerous, it's recommended those are actually done as a matter of urgency. Anything that's marked up as further investigation should be uh, investigated further without delay. And observations classified as improvement recommended should be given due consideration. Now, most improvement recommended or C3 things 
will be stuff that did comply with regulations at the time it was installed, but due to changes in various things, they don't comply anymore. And the most common one here is the lack of RCDs on things like socket outlets, because until fairly recently those weren't actually required for all socket outlets, so it's very common to find on installations that some sockets may have them and others do not. At the time that was perfectly acceptable, but of course now RCDs are required on all socket outlets, so that would be an uh, example of a doesn't comply, but it's not actually going to be dangerous. Nothing's actually changed in terms of safety, it's just that the regulations have been updated to require things which weren't required at the time. And then here, subject to the necessary immediate action being taken, it's recommended the installation is further inspected and tested by whatever date. Typically it's going to be, say, up to 10 years for a domestic installation. Again, can be less depending on the specific circumstances. And note that it's subject to the necessary immediate action being taken. So in other words, if there's anything here which was dangerous or potentially dangerous, this is implying that if once those are fixed and repaired, then the installation should be re-inspected at a particular date. It does not mean that you can just leave it for five years with all these dangerous things going on, because of course the whole point of this is that if there is stuff that needs to be rectified, that it's done so perfectly as soon as possible. And the bottom here again, it's just the uh, person's or person who's done the inspection and testing, name, address and so on at the bottom. And then finally here we've just got how many additional sheets we've got, so how many uh, schedules of inspection and the test results are attached, so just how many pages. Now this side again, the top is the same as the electrical installation certificate, so just the characteristics of the particular installation. So again, we've covered that in the other video. And then we get down to this section K, which are the observations, and again referring to the items which are attached and subject to limitations specified in the extent and limitations of inspection section. Then I've got two choices here. No remedial action is required, so in other words everything is just perfect and fine and there's nothing that doesn't comply and it's all 100% perfect. Horribly unlikely that's going to be used, but certainly not impossible. More likely is that there's going to be things which do not, and then you would tick here. And then in the section here you would fill in whatever those actual things are. There are some lines missing here because it didn't copy uh, particularly well from the book. And note that this is quite a short section, so in reality you're going to use uh, many continuation pages for these because obviously you're not going to be able to write a whole lot of stuff in there. So this is a short text description, and it should also include a reference, as it says here, to the additional page, which we'll look at in a moment. And ideally you want to put in here the regulation or regulations to which it's referring as well. So that would be the numbers from the book here. I'll sort of print it down the sides there. And the reason for that is you don't want to put stuff in here that is just sort of some kind of general thing like uh, rewire is required or something because it's fairly meaningless. What you should put in there is things like uh, cabling is deteriorated or the insulation is failing, refer to a certain regulation or live parts are exposed, put another regulation in as well. And the column here is one of four codes you can put in. We can see those at the bottom of the sheet here. C1 is danger present, risk of injury, immediate remedial action required. Now there aren't actually many things that can be a C1. The most likely one is that live parts are exposed, either because something is broken, damaged, or the cables weren't connectedly attached, for example. Say like a hole in the front of a consumer where there's a missing blank would be a C1 because obviously the uh, things could be exposed within. And again, things like take damaged cabling or say sockets with the front smashed off and bare metal exposed. So those ones are dangerous right now and they really need to be dealt with immediately. C2 is uh, far more common, potentially dangerous, urgent remedial action is required. So in other words this is going to be something that could be dangerous but at this particular moment it's not actually presenting any particular risk but if some other event then occurred this could then lead to a dangerous situation occurring. Things like this here would be that there's no earth for the installation because uh, the earth not being there doesn't necessarily make it dangerous right now, but then if a fault occurs at some subsequent point, the lack of an earth could result in live parts being exposed or whatever, and uh, voltages appearing on exposed metalwork. So uh, C2 is really a sort of a step down from that, but it's important to bear in mind that both of these things here, C1 and C2, would result in unsatisfactory for the outcome of the installation. So if you've got any of these, or one or both of those, then on the first page here you're going to be marking uh, the unsatisfactory item, because it's clearly not acceptable to have things which are either dangerous or very shortly will be. 
C3 is improvement recommended, and as we saw on the first page there, that's based on things which don't comply with the regulations, but aren't necessarily dangerous, and are not likely to become dangerous. And so the most common thing is stuff that previously did comply, but of course now doesn't because of various changes and things that have been put in, and RCDs missing on uh, circuits things is certainly one of those. And the fourth one here, which is further investigation required, this isn't used that often, because it basically means that although you've been to this particular site and uh, for the specific purpose of actually doing a test and inspection, for some reason you couldn't actually fully investigate this particular item, so therefore it's going to be necessary for you or somebody else to come back at a later time and do a load more testing and inspection to find out what the actual problem was. So though that can be used, it's not something you're going to use particularly often, but the option is there if it was some particularly complex issue which uh, couldn't easily be determined what the problem was. But on most installations, if there is a problem, it's going to be fairly obvious as to what that is, so it will be one of the uh, one, two, and three items we've got listed there. Now this page and the uh, second uh, following on page is essentially a list of things which uh, require inspection. And bearing in mind, inspection is something you're going to be doing mildly with your eyes, and so on doing things and poking them with the screwdrivers and making sure wires are securely attached and they're the right colour not uh, damaged or overheated and burnt and all that kind of thing. So the uh, inspection part is not particularly involving test equipment. It's certainly a case of actually looking at things and making sure they are all correct. So the testing is done on the separate sheet. Now I've got a list of all things here and it's grouped into various uh, different sections. And over this side, it's a question of either putting a uh, tick here if it's acceptable. One of the codes which you saw on the previous page, if it's not, so C1, C2, C3 or further investigation. And in addition here we've got not verified, which means you didn't actually look at it. Limitation means that uh, it couldn't actually be accessed for some reason, so say it might be uh, locked away in a cupboard or something, you couldn't get in there, or buried under the floorboards or some other problem. And not applicable, because uh, certain things on this list simply won't exist in a particular installation, so of course they uh, don't apply and you're not going to be inspecting them. Now the first section here is for the uh, distributors or supply intake equipment, and uh, this is the stuff which belongs to the electricity distributor, and we've got the items here, the service cable, as in the cable comes into the building, service head, which is the thing with the uh, main fuse in it, the earthing arrangement, which is just the connection that the uh, electricity company has provided for the earth. Now, of course, that may not be applicable in some cases because they don't always provide that on a uh, TT installation. The uh, meter tails. Now we've got the two parts there, the distributor and the consumer side, so one's before the meter and the others are after the meter. Conditioning of the metering equipment itself and condition of any isolator, and again where present because not all installations actually have those. So you would uh, obviously check that these items are in good condition, they're not sort of falling off the wall and there's no obvious damage to the outside, sort of cracked and broken parts and so on. And then again if the uh, O's are acceptable then you would just tick over here as applicable. And of course where they don't exist, such as the isolator, that would definitely be a case of putting uh, not applicable, because if there isn't one, obviously you can't inspect it. Uh, present vantage arrangements for other sources, such as microgenerators, again that may well not be applicable, because if you haven't got additional sources of supply, then obviously it's not going to be applying. Now earthing and bonding arrangements, and uh, from this point onwards we've got the actual regulation numbers printed in here, so the actual regulations printed next to each item. And also the chapter which this refers to in chapter 54 in this case. So if any doubt about what these are actually referring to, you can simply uh, refer to the particular number here and then just look it up in the book to see exactly what is required. So there's not really any particular mystery about uh, filling these in, it's just uh, obviously reading what's there and looking it up in the book if necessary. And as with the other ones, it's either tick or the codes applicable. So uh, presence and condition of the distributed earthing arrangement and the earth electrode connection where applicable, so if it's a say TNCS supply, well, that's not going to be applicable. Provision of earthing and bonding labels at all appropriate locations. Confirmation of the earthing conductor size, obviously it may well be too small on certain older installations. That could be an example, say, of a C3. That being too small isn't actually going to necessarily be dangerous. It just means that, uh, say, on a TNCS one, it may have had a 6mm in the past, Regulations now require a minimum of 10. But again, it was perfectly safe when it was installed, so that situation hasn't changed. Accessibility and condition of the earthing conductor at the main earthing terminal, or MET. 
Confirmation of the main protective bonding conductor sizes. Again, similar with the other one there, that they may find that they're undersized. But again, that's not actually a dangerous situation. It just means they really should be upgraded to the correct size to comply now. Condition and accessibility of the main protective bonding conductor connections, and obviously of the uh, any other bonding connections as well. This one can also be not applicable in many cases. Because being why we've got the main ones and supplementary bonding often isn't required in a lot of new properties, subject to other conditions being met. Now, when it's saying accessibility, what this means is you can actually get to them reasonably easily and confirm that they are properly connected and the screws are tightened up and whatever. So if you find that, say, in the bathroom, the uh, say supplementary bonding was underneath the bath and someone put a bit of plywood over the front and then put a load of tiles over the top, pretty obviously that's not acceptable because accessibility clearly isn't going to be met there. And the same with these other items here. It's not uncommon to find things that have been uh, accessible when they were installed, but then subsequently the uh, changes to the building or someone installed a kitchen over the front of it means that these things no longer can be reached. And we'll look at again at the end of this video at certain uh, pictures and things which I've found, so you can see some examples of those. Uh, this section here is about the consumer units and distribution boards, and it can be just one or a whole uh, series of them. And a lot of this is semi fairly similar again, so adequacy of working space and accessibility, so can you actually get to the thing without uh, crawling under a cupboard or in some constricted space? Security of fixing, so is it actually attached to the wall, is it hanging off, so you're going to have to get hold of it and pull on it, see if it's uh, properly fixed there. Condition of the enclosure, in terms of its rating, IP rating and fire rating, so you don't want massive holes in the side or the top. Enclosure is not damaged or deteriorated, so you'll see things like big cracks and bits broken out the front. Presence of the main link switch. Generally it's going to be in there, but don't assume anything, because uh, just because it should be there doesn't mean it will be. And then we've got operation of the main switch and manual operation of these circuit breakers. So you do actually need to turn the main switch on and off, and also the circuit breakers and RCDs on and off. And once you've turned them off, actually confirm with the test device that the circuits have actually been disconnected. Because just because the switch has moved, contacts inside can fail and jam closed or even jam open. So you need to actually confirm all of those. Identification of circuits and protective devices. So again, there should be appropriate labelling provided. RCD test notice on the consumer unit, assuming you've got RCDs, of course. And presence of non-standard colour warning notices. Again, only if there's actually uh, mixed cable colours within the installation. Presence of alternative supply warning. And again, that's only applicable if there is actually some other source of supply. And any other required labelling, which is required, or well, this is in the uh, section 514. Now, a lot of that might seem quite minor in that sort of part there, as it's really just ensuring that appropriate labels are put there. But labelling is important, and it is a requirement of these various uh, regulations here. So again, if that wasn't there, those would all be C3 items. The fact that the label's not there isn't going to be dangerous, so not a C1 or a C2, but because they are needed, then uh, C3 you would put there. Examination of the protective devices, make sure they're the correct type and the correct rating, no signs of unacceptable thermal damage, arcing and overheating. So obviously you don't want to make sure that the things like fuses in particular you can put the wrong uh, fuse wires inside, so you need to take any rewirable fuses out and actually look at the wire inside. And again, it's fairly common on the rewirable types to find there's uh, evidence of previous arcing and failures, in which case that would not be acceptable. Single pole switching in the line conductor only, and being one, this is only for the consumer unit, because we're not talking about the circuits here, so any circuit breaks and fusing needs to be in the line conductor, not in the neutral. Protection against mechanical damage where cables enter the consumer unit, and also against electromagnetic effects where the cables enter. Particularly with metal consumer units, you want to make sure there's appropriate glands and grommets here, so the cables aren't damaged by the sharp metal edges. And in theory, you're not supposed to put uh, line and neutral through separate holes because it could cause overheating in the metal structure. Although a certain test we did some while ago doesn't exactly uh, show that to be a problem. But again, it is a regulation, so uh, if that was the case, you would uh, make a note of it. RCD is provided for fault protection. This is only really for TT supplies. Um, because note, it's the fault protection we're talking about. So this is when a fault between line and earth occurs. And normally with a uh, TNC type or TNCS type installation, then you would be relying on the high current there, which would trip out the circuit breaker or blow the fuse. 
on the TT system, that won't happen, so you're relying on the RCD there to disconnect in the event of a fault. So that's only applicable really for TT type installations. And then RCD is for additional protection, and this is the one where you have it for the socket outlets, concealed cables and things like that. Confirmation of indication that the surge protective device is functional. Now SPDs are fairly uncommon currently, but some installations do have them and it may be something that's more common in the future. And what this is saying is that all these surge protective devices have a little indicator on the front, whichever it's green or red, and if they are fitted you just need to confirm that it is showing as in an operational state. I haven't actually failed. If that failed of course it would require replacement. Confirmation all conductor connections, including connections to bus bars, are correctly located in the terminals and are tight and secure. So you need to get out a screwdriver and just make sure all the screws are actually tight. Now it's important when doing this, you're not actually going to be tightening up even more, because if you over tighten things it can damage the conductors. But you do need to put a screwdriver in there and just make sure they're not actually loose. And the thing with the uh, correctly located is to make sure that the wires, and particularly certain types of bus bar, are actually in the proper place because on certain poor quality consumer units where the bus bar is removable it is possible to put the bus bar in the bottom of all the circuit breakers and on one or more of them actually miss where the clamping part actually is. So though you tighten up the screw it's not actually clamping over the metal part of the bus bar and it may still operate in that state. That's a source of possible loose connection and a good source of overheating and faults at a later time. So you do need to actually get down there and have a look maybe use a small mirror to examine the thing underneath there if it's not possible to get down there and look at it very easily. An adequate arrangement here which really refers to additional generating supplies either as a backup or one that operates in parallel. Again those are uh, regulations appropriate there and there. Those operating in parallel are fairly uncommon because that means it would run at the same time as being connected to the mains. More common though is the backup style which uh, if there's a power failure, the generator will start and the installation is switched over to that one. Now the second page here is about final circuits. So bear in mind all that other stuff was just the consumer unit. This is actually the circuit connected to the consumer unit. Identification of conductors. Generally this means that they're the correct colour. So if it's brown then it's going to be the line conductor. Blue for neutral and of course black and red in the older installation. And this also means that if you say got a switch where it's line and switch line and someone to use twin and other cabling. You want to see that there's actually a brown sleeve over the blue conductor to indicate it is actually a switch line, or red sleeving over the black if it's an older type. Cables correctly supported throughout their run. This can really only be inspected on exposed cabling. Obviously if it's under the floor in the walls or whatever you're not going to be able to really confirm or deny that. Condition of insulation of live parts. And again, are things sort of cracked, broken, damaged? It's uh, cables with a big slice through it, or has a rat been uh, chewing at the uh, wires and there's bare copper showing through. Non sheathed cables, which means uh, basically singles, as in it's just the copper with a single coloured insulation over it, they need to be inside an enclosure, such as conduit ducting or trunking. And where those are used, the integrity of the trunking and conduit system also needs to be confirmed, so you don't want just random bits of it sort of tacked together. Conduit systems do need to be complete and uh, fully contained over the entire wiring system. Adequacy of cables for current carrying capacity for regard to the type and nature of installation. So this implies that just because a cable is the correct size, if say it was a shower circuit and someone had installed it in loft and then someone else had come along later and put tons of loft insulation over the top, that may not be acceptable because if you cover insulation over cables it reduces their current carrying capacity significantly. So again, that's something to uh, look for. Coordination between conductors and overload protective devices. And this is really, are the cables things properly sized with respect to the circuit breakers or fuses they are connected to? So of course you wouldn't want, say, a 1mm conductor on a uh, 50 amp shower circuit because of course that's going to overheat long before the fuse or circuit breaker operates. And we have adequacy of protective devices. Type and rated current for fault protection. So this is again your short circuit situation. Are they of the correct type? Do they have the correct braking capacity? And again, are they actually going to disconnect the fault should one occur? Prince and adequacy of circuit protective conductors. So in other words, are they actually present? And if they are present, are they the correct size? Why systems appropriate for the type and nature of the installation and external influences? So again, you don't want to have things like, uh, say, twin and earth cable 
just buried down the garden to a shed because of course it could easily be damaged there. And again, if it's going to go through environments such as they're extremely hot or very high humidity, this kind of thing, you want to make sure that whatever's been used is actually appropriate for that. Concealed cables in prescribed zones. Now, unfortunately, this is very rarely possible to actually examine because, of course, the very fact that they're concealed means you can't actually see precisely where they go. Now, of course, cables in the wall should be in specific places, as detailed by the regulation, but as it says here, there's a lot of limitations here because obviously you can't really rip the walls apart just to check the cables were in fact vertical from a particular socket or something. So often that's going to be a limitation, simply the fact that you can't actually see them. And again here you've got the cables under the floors above ceilings and walls adequately protected against damage. But once again it's fairly unlikely you're going to be able to see those unless you're starting ripping up floors and the like, so again that may be a limitation as well. Additional protection by RCD, not exceeding 30 milliamps for these items, so socket outlets and mobile equipment, cables in the walls and cables in walls with metallic parts. And again, a lot of these would end up being a C3 because older installations didn't actually require RCDs for those items, so again those could be C3s there. Unlikely you're going to get any C1 or C2 here because the fact there's no RCD on say, a socket outlet doesn't mean it's dangerous or likely to become so. It's just that the regulations have been updated since to require these things. Provision of five barriers, ceiling arrangements, and protection against thermal effects. So where cables and things pass through walls, floors, or whatever, then you do need to make sure the holes are properly sealed up because obviously you don't want fire and things roaring through those things. Not particularly relevant in, uh, say, just one person's house, but definitely of importance in, say, blocks of flats and things where cables obviously go through various floors of the building. Now, I'll say you don't want obviously fire and toxic gases to be going through the holes and they're not correctly sealed. Band 2 and band 1 cables are separated. This is essentially your mains wiring and then other cabling, such as, say, for alarms or communications and this kind of thing. You want to make sure they are appropriately separated. And also, cables separated from non electrical services. So, having a cable just sort of tie wrapped onto a gas pipe, for example, that's not going to be acceptable. Obviously you want to use the proper clips and support for the electrical cabling. One main reason for this is that uh, if you've, say, attached a cable to a gas pipe that just happens to be handy in the area, what happens when someone comes along and needs to alter or modify the gas pipe? And you obviously can't because you've attached a lot of cables to it. Termination of cables at enclosures. This is one way you can just do a sample of them, say 25% or something. You don't necessarily have to open all of them. And for those you are going to look at, connections are soundly made and not under any undue strain. No basic insulation, as in the blue and brown or coloured parts, is visible outside the enclosure. Connections of live conductors are adequately enclosed and adequately connected at the point of entry to an enclosure with glands and bushes and other things. So what I want to make sure is all of the coloured insulation is only within the enclosure. It doesn't actually go outside. You've obviously got the proper things there to make sure the cable's not damaged. And in the case of things like armoured cabling, you need to have the proper glands fitted on the ends make sure it is correctly attached. Now if you said at the initial outset you're going to say do 10% of these, if you open some of them and find that they're all perfectly good and wonderful then there's not really much point going and looking at all of them because it's generally the case that uh, whoever installed it is going to do pretty much the same thing on all of the things. However if you said we're going to check 10% and then you went to some of them and the first five you opened had uh, massive amounts of bare copper showing and the insulation had been ripped back uh, many inches outside the box and all the glands and grommets were missing, then it would probably be worthwhile having a look at more than you originally intended, because clearly uh, if some of them are going to be bad you can pretty much assume that most of them will be the same. And we have condition of the accessories like sockets, switches and joint boxes, so again, not broken, cracked, uh, smashed in half. Suitability of the accessories for external influences. So again, if they're going to be outside, you would expect some kind of uh, water resistance to be involved there. I certainly wouldn't want a normal light switch just stuck on the wall outside. And uh, again, there are possibly things in areas such as bathrooms or shower areas. And uh, generally it's a question of checking the appropriate rating that's required for a particular area. And certainly things in bathrooms, you can uh, look those up in the regulations. Adequacy of working space and accessibility to equipment. Again, very similar to what I had with a consumer unit, but this actually applies to things like switches and other equipment there. Single pole switching in line conductors only, so mainly light switches here, which is single pole. They should switch the line conductor and not the neutral. If they were switching the neutral, the light would still turn on and off, but of course when the light was off it would mean that the actual lamp holder was still live. Not a safe idea. And then the last short bit here, this piece is for 
anything in the bathroom or shower. And then this one says other part seven special locations, of which there's actually quite a lot. If there were any of those, you would have to, of course, use a separate page because obviously you're not going to fit any real information in there. But, uh, the one for the bathroom is that we've got additional protection for all low voltage circuits by RCD. Bearing in mind, low voltage here includes 230 volt AC circuits. And uh, it's now required that all circuits within the bathroom are protected by an RCD. That may well be another one of these C3 things, which basically means that at the time they didn't all need an RCD, particularly lighting. But again, now they do. Where users a protective measure, requirements for salve or pelve are met. Not actually that common. You can get certain extractor fans which are salve ones, they run on say 12 volts or whatever. Some lighting might also be 12 volts. Shaver sockets are another example of that. We've actually got these uh, separately here, so they are actually a isolated type of supply. And where they do exist, they need to comply with this standard or the former one. To confirm whether it's or not, you can just take it off the wall. And if it does comply with these, it's quite often just stamped or printed on the back. If it doesn't have either, then you're going to have to put down that it presumably does not. Because generally stuff that complies with standards has that printed on it somewhere. Supplementary bonding. Do they exist? But bearing in mind, they don't always have to be put there. Again, the regulation here refers to the circumstances where they are no longer required. Socket outlets are at least three metres from the zone one. And again, remember, zone voltage is including uh, 230 volt items. Unlikely to find sockets in the bathroom. If they are, they need to be three metres away from the edge of the bath or shower. Unfortunately, that means your bathroom has to be gigantic. So not something you come on off very commonly. But bearing in mind, it's not unbelievable for people to put uh, sockets just in a bathroom anyhow because they wanted to put their radio or something in there. Suitability equipment for external influences for the location and also accessories and control gear for the particular zone. So again, if there's stuff going to be installed within the zones of the bathroom, so very close to the bath or even above it or even in the bath, again, it needs to be appropriate and designed for those locations. And again, for currently using equipment, Again, it needs to be suitable for its particular location. So you're going to have an electric shower stored directly above the bath. Generally, it's going to be made to uh, be installed in that location. Now, that's the uh, two pages of those. This covers the most common things which definitely do need to be inspected. But bearing in mind, this is not everything that needs to be inspected because, of course, many different types of installations. So it's fairly common you're going to have things which are not on these lists, which, again, definitely should be looked at and uh, inspected in many cases. So it's certainly possible we're going to need several continuation pages and things to add in additional items which have been inspected. Certain things with, say, the special locations bit down here. Because obviously there's only that tiny box for that. And again, these are just the model generic ones. So in reality, you're going to be buying, say, a set of pads or software or whatever, which would uh, have much better space for this sort of thing. Now, the rest of this video, I've actually got a whole load of pictures for things which I've looked at over the years. And we're going to have a look at some of those and see what is actually wrong with these. And a lot of those are examples of things which you can be finding on this sheet. So we'll have a look at some of those. Some of the pictures are quite old and they're rather poor quality because they were taken quite a long time ago. But nevertheless, they're quite useful for examples of things which you need to look for. And for those that don't know, which is probably most people, I do have a website with a lot of this stuff on there as well, including lots of other pictures which are not in this video. That can be found at flameport.com. Here's an example of a broken socket. So it's pretty obvious just a big massive crack all the way through the front there. This is a shaver outlet, but uh, same would apply for pretty much anything else. Now this is a connection underneath a boiler. Uh, this is presumably what the installer of the boiler thought was an appropriate method of connection. So we've basically got some uh, screw terminals there, and they've just uh, bodged a load of insulation tape over the top. Now of course this doesn't comply because we saw that they use things need to be inside some kind of enclosure. And that also needs some appropriate strain relief and fixing for the cables. And you can also see there the coloured insulation is actually showing through the crappy insulation tape. So obviously not acceptable. Now this is a uh, consumer unit. And inside here we've got a uh, reasonably untidy looking thing, which is uh, fairly common. And on this particular one we can have a look in in the centre there on that uh, RCBO, which is the taller one. And you can see at the top there where the wires go into the top there, there is quite a bit of exposed copper. Now that's not actually totally acceptable because the wires should go in as on the other things there so there's no copper viewing. But anyway, this is not particularly dangerous because this is only accessible 
when the front cover is removed, so uh, although not ideal, again, it's not uh, really the end of the world either. Now here's another consumer unit, so this one is actually on the floor. Now this isn't uh, appallingly bad, but uh, it's worth considering whether this is really an appropriate location, because actually getting to it is going to be quite difficult for people, particularly if they're elderly or whatever, if something needed to be reset. And also, uh, although this is in a hallway, if that table wasn't there, that could be uh, quite susceptible to people damaging it by uh, shoving uh, push chairs and wheelchairs and who knows what right past it. So not necessarily a complete disaster, but certainly uh, not the best position either. Now here we have another consumer unit, and again it's fairly untidy in there. This is very common, and the fact it's untidy is not a uh, defect particularly. There's no regulation that says it has to be all tidy and lovely. And on this particular one we can see that the wires actually go in the top somewhat better, so there's pretty much no visible copper above the top of the terminals. And what to put it note on this one is we've got a whole selection of different ways that cables can enter. So if we start at the bottom left here, we've got this uh, brass bushing which goes into a steel coupler there. And again, that's fine because the inside of those brass bits are properly smoothed. At the top left there, we've actually got an armoured cable coming in there with the proper gland and the lock nut. Next to that, we've got a bit of twin and earth coming in via a rubber grommet there, so just poke through the hole. And then over at the right, we've got a uh, gland there, which again is a plastic one, fits through, then it uh, basically tightens down onto that round flex, which goes out to the right side. And then at the bottom, where you can't actually see, we've got a couple more armoured cables and the uh, again socket there with the gland and the coupler on that. So all of those are perfectly acceptable. Just for a demonstration of the various types of fitting that can be used. Now this is an electricity meter, and it's uh, screwed on the usual piece of plywood at the back there. Uh, nothing uh, too disastrous here. But if you look underneath the meter, you can see where those cables go in on the right side, where you've got the grey insulation that's been stripped away, and then you can see the internal uh, black inside. So that really shouldn't be showing, because that's just the single insulation. That grey should go all the way up to the meter itself. And then on the left side, which is the incoming supply, what we've actually got here is a uh, copper-clad cable, and those red and black are the inner cores, which may have a bit of sleeving over them. And then there's that uh, gland at the bottom of the picture. That should be fixed into some kind of metal enclosure or box. As you can see there, it isn't. Here's a view uh, a bit lower down of the same installation. And you can see that's the main incoming cable. It's a uh, copper cable or MIMS, or pyro as it's sometimes called. So that gland on the end is fitted properly, but say that threaded bit should go into some sort of enclosure. And then, uh, unfortunately, because there's no enclosure, someone has just tacked on a couple of these pipe clamps there with the earth connection. So although it has got an earth connection, that's not really a very satisfactory way of doing it. And you'll also notice the cable is just coming out of the wall on the left there. There's no support or fixing for it, it's just literally hanging in the breeze. Now here's an example of lack of working space and access. So here we have a electricity meter and consumer unit. Now of course you can't actually see it because currently it's uh, not in view. But if we zoom in a bit closer, then you may be able to see it. Now, if you have a look in the back of there, you can just about make out some dark shape there in the back of that sideways cupboard. So if we just brighten that up a bit, then you can see there possibly the edge of the electricity meter and the consumer unit. And then if you actually climb right inside the cupboard and sort of crawl around that corner, then this is what you find in there. So we've got the consumer unit there and the electricity meter and also the cutout or head there, which is the thing with the fuse in it, that black thing on the lower right. Now this of course is not acceptable, because that's ridiculously difficult to get to, and that's assuming the cupboard is empty, and of course in reality it'll be filled with junk. And also notice that this particular electricity meter is of the style where you have a key which goes in, and then you take the key to a shop and have it recharged. So the whoever lives here is going to have to actually get in here and put the key in it quite often, so that makes it even worse. So totally unacceptable. Obviously what's happened here is they uh, fitted the kitchen over all of this stuff, and whoever fitted the kitchen either didn't know or couldn't care less. Now here we have a main intake for a larger commercial building, and the uh, great thing at the bottom here is basically where all the uh, fuses are contained. Single electricity meter there, which is just for the shared corridors and whatever. And uh, the uh, switch to the right there is the isolator, again, for the shared common parts. And to the right of the switch we can see the main earthing terminal there, and it's got two wires connected to it. The one at the bottom basically goes down into the cabinet below for the earth connection, and then the one on the top there comes out and goes up through that uh, metal trunking above to the floors above where the distribution board is located. Now the thing that's missing here is the main bonding to the gas, 
And you can see the gas pipes just over to the right there, there's quite a few of them. Those are coming in directly from below. And as you can see, there's absolutely no connection between the gas pipes and the earthing terminal whatsoever. So presumably someone just forgot to put it in there for some reason. So never assume that it's all going to be lovely and well, because clearly in this case it's just completely missing. Now of course in this case it's very easy just to install them, but nevertheless uh, it doesn't exist in the time of this photo, so of course that was a defect. Now this is a domestic installation. As you can see, this is in a very poor state indeed. All of those things are just hanging off the wall there. Live parts are exposed. That is rubber coated wiring underneath there, and it's all crumbling away to dust, and uh, quite frankly should have been replaced decades earlier. So uh, no testing required there to note that it's definitely a C1, immediate danger. Here's a closer look at some of it, and you can see that little switch in the centre. The two cotton covered wires coming out the top. The uh, left one is the neutral, and the right hand one is the line. And you can see the line one, there's a good half an inch of bare metal exposed. And touch that, of course, and probably going to die. And underneath you can see the crusty old cotton covered wires coming out the bottom. All of these are far too small as well. Wooden fuse boxes and all kinds of other antiquated junk. Now if you go to a block of flats, you may find all the meters and other things are all in one big cupboard. Here's an example of such a thing, and this is a pretty bit of a messy disaster. However, if you're only going to be inspecting, say, one of the flats, you're only going to be reporting on the particular items which apply to that flat only. So uh, although this is a bit of a shambling mess, and you might want to uh, make a note of that and advise the building owners that this could do with a bit of an upgrade, in reality if you're only doing, say, one of the flats, then it's only going to be one of these particular bits of equipment. This picture is nothing inherently wrong with it, it just shows you an older Economy 7 style of setup. So have got the electricity meter there with the twin rate, so low and normal, as marked on the dial to the right there. And then this one's actually switched with a time clock, and this is just an older electric motor driven thing, so it just basically turns around and when it gets to the particular time in question it will switch the meter over to the other rate. And in the case of this one you see the additional wires from the bottom of the timer, and those would switch on your storage heaters or whatever at night. These are not normally fitted now because they're very expensive, and no one actually makes them like that any longer. Of course they're now replaced with the tele-switch type of things, and of course uh, in the fairly near future that will be all done by the smart meters. This is another Economy 7 type of installation, and we can see the uh, meter in the centre is actually a teleswitch and metering in the same unit. That's a, a Horseman uh, manufactured item there. And we can see that uh, this has had various additions over the years. The grey consumer unit or fuse box to the top left is the original one. And you can see the front there is labelled lighting and power for the circuits there, and then heating underneath. But at some point this has been repurposed, and we've got the smaller white fuse box there with the uh, coloured fuse holders there. And then uh, additionally we've got a third one on the right there, which is actually labelled heating only on the top. So quite a lot of uh, changes and alterations have gone on here, and it's obviously at various different times as well. Other things we've got here, we've got a uh, doorbell transformer on the upper right there, that's the white thing with the black lines on it. And then uh, because we've got all these multiple uh, fuse boxes and things, we've got some connector blocks there on the left. And the supply coming in at the bottom left there, note that the uh, cutout there has a red fuse carrier there, and this indicates that there's no actual fuse inside, that's just going to be a solid link. So the purpose of that is purely for disconnection when the meter is replaced, and this was in another block of flats. And the deal here is that the actual fuse is located in the basement in another cupboard, similar to that one we saw in the uh, previous picture of that large grey Lucy cabinet. So any one of these red, generally means there's just a solid link in there, no fuse inside. Now here's another fairly grotty installation. This is in a cupboard, and uh, this is the installation for a particular house. Now we can see this one is definitely going to fall foul of the security of fixing regulation, because that board in the back there, with the uh, cutout at a jaunty angle, and various other bits and pieces tacked on it, it's only being held in place by that big metal cross in the sort of centre of the picture there, and that was actually loose, and although the board has got a couple of screws in the top corners, they weren't actually screwed into anything because the wall behind had crumbled away and wasn't actually fixed to anything. The little fuse box at the top right also had a weird angle, and all the wires just pulling out of it and not supported in any way. That is actually screwed to that thin piece of timber across the top, and that thin piece of timber was basically just wedged in position, and someone had made an effort of putting a couple of screws in, but again the wall was all crumbly and horrible, so that was pretty much held up by nothing, until someone had put another strip of timber underneath, 
and you're sort of tucked it behind that uh, metal cross thing. So there's pretty much nothing holding any of this in position. And if I look at the bottom of this picture, you can see all these various cables and things just sort of hanging in the breeze, not supported or secured in any way. And we've got a couple of older type fuse boxes there as well, all of which were still in use to uh, various different circuits and various bits of cables just jointed together there, and generally a bit of a mess all over. Now this picture here is an example of the labelling. Now this has quite a lot of labelling in it, and all of this is actually required. So on the left side we've got a consumer in it there, which is just for some storage heaters. And then, uh, of course, that is one that turned on with the Economy 7 type of thing. In the centre there we've got the two labels, one of which is for the actual inspection date. So this particular one was uh, inspected on the 19th of October 2015. And the next inspection should be in October 2020, so that's a five-year item. Underneath there we've got the RCD test notice that suggests you should test it uh, quarterly or whatever by pressing the test button. And underneath the consumer unit we can see the other yellow one there indicates that there's two sets of wiring colours, so we've got the red and black and the blue and brown as well. And then on the front of the consumer unit there we can see the various circuits are clearly labelled, so lights and other things, there's a couple there which aren't currently in use, and the main switch. And then below that we can see a little label there for the doorbell connection, which is actually a plug and a socket type of thing. Doorbell transformer in the centre there, that uh, large black object. And we can also see the cables on the top there are at least reasonably well attached, and they're not going to be sort of just flapping around and falling off. Now this uh, car crash of a consumer unit was apparently installed by somebody who had installed an electric shower. Now I'm not going to call him a plumber because uh, even a plumber could do a much better job than this disaster. Now this is just some generic cheapo consumer unit which someone just shoved in there in replacement of some other fuse holding thing. Presumably they did this because there was no RCD on the fuse box so they thought well we'll just replace the entire lot but as you can see all the wires in here are sort of jointed with various types of connectors and there's bits of tape in there and all kinds of other stuff. The circuit breaker near the centre of the picture has nothing connected to it, which is uh, kind of pointless to really put it in there. But by far the worst one on this one is the RCD on the left side. Now you can see on the top there we've got the two large cables coming in, the blue and the brown, and that's actually the incoming supply for the RCD. And then what should happen is that the wires come out at the bottom and supply those two circuit breakers on the left, the B6 and the B40. But if you look on the top of the RCD, you see there's an extra brown wire coming out of that, which comes up and over and disappears down behind those circuit breakers. Here's the view from underneath, and there's that brown wire coming in, and you see it just goes into the bottom of the first circuit breaker, and then there's a little loop which goes over to the second one. And then if we look from underneath, there's the output of the RCD, so the right-hand one with that copper bar basically comes out the bottom of the RCD and goes into the circuit breakers, and that's exactly what should be on the left one. But as you see, the output tone on that RCD is conspicuously empty. So basically what they've done here is, because there was some fault on one of the circuits on the left there, when they first installed it, the RCD was just tripping continuously and wouldn't even switch on. So rather than go and find the fault and fix it, they've just removed the bus bar and threw it away, and then they put a bit of wire underneath from the top linked to the bottom of those two uh, circuit breakers together. Additionally, they've also connected the two neutrals for those circuits separately, which is what one of those toner blocks on the top was for. So that RCD basically does nothing at all, and it won't have a trip because it's not even in the circuit, and as you can see it's actually switched off in the picture there, so of course it's uh, not actually controlling anything. So what a complete and utter disaster, and again shows the value of actually looking at where the wires are connected, not just assuming that whoever installed it had the slightest clue what they were doing. Now here we've got an older type consumer unit with the uh, circuit breakers in, this is an MEM model. Four circuits there, and what I've note here is that uh, on the uh, circuit breakers there you've got the four wires coming off the top. Three of these are plastic, the red ones, the sort of one, two and four positions. That one in the middle there with the 32 amp and the single wire, that is actually some ancient old rubber insulated stuff. And if we zoom in a bit there you can see that the actual insulation is all crumbling away and falling apart. And there's actually a piece of exposed bare wire in there, which of course is a live part. So, although this is reasonably up to date when at first glance, careful looking there shows that one of the circuits is some ancient old thing from 70 odd years ago. And in addition to this, if you look at where the incoming wires are on the right hand side, the black and the single red there, you can again see that that is in fact some crappy old rubber insulated rubbish, and again it's deteriorating certainly at the end where the red wire goes into the terminal and even the black one there has some signs of damage on the front. So all is certainly not well with this one, 
So certainly a fair amount of repair and remediation is going to be needed there. Now here we have a socket outlet, a single one. This is fitted in a skirting board. And of course it looks nice on the front, fairly up-to-date item. Beyond removing it, again we've got the uh, black and red wires there. And you can see that they're actually single insulated and they have to go through two separate holes in the metal enclosure. There's also no earth sleeving on the earth wires there, which are just twisted together. And of course there's no grommets on those holes either, so it's very likely that those wires could be damaged where the sharp metal edges are. So someone would obviously strip this back uh, much too far because this is actually twin and earth type cable. You just see the uh, outer grey covering to the bottom right of the picture. And then they've just basically separated the red and black and shoved them through separate holes for some inexplicable reason. And generally, if you find something like that on an installation, you can be pretty sure that most of the others are going to be just as bad. So here we have another socket on the same installation. Again, it's in the skirting board. And as before, there's no insulation or sleeving on the earth conductors there, the twisted grey metal ones to the left. And although the line and neutral do come through the same holes in this case, as before, it's been stripped back way too far and there's no grommets in the holes, so the metal edges, of course, can damage those cables. This is a bit out of focus, but uh, this is what happens when you have old rubber insulated wiring. What we've got here is a uh, twin and uh, not earth, because there isn't one, and it's sort of a black insulated outer covering, and then it was red and black rubber insulated wires inside. Now the switch on the front is relatively modern, but the insulation is completely falling off and crumbling away to nothing, exposing live conductors there. And bearing in mind it's got a metal back box, just about see at the top left of the picture. There's no earth connection to any of this, so the worst that's going to happen here is that uh, these wires will contact the metal backing of that, and that makes the whole of the back plate live, and also the screws that fix the switch to the box. And of course the fuse won't blow or anything because there's no earth connection to any of this. It'll just sit there waiting for someone to touch it and get an electric shock. And even if these wires short together, all that would happen is the light would just stay on all the time, and again all the things would still be live waiting to kill somebody. The wiring in this installation was way, way past its replacement date. Uh, best estimate on this is this wiring dated from the 1950s, and this was still in use uh, in the sort of mid-2000s when this photo was taken. Now here we've got an example of an earth connection or bonding connection, which again does not exist. Now what we've got here is a TV distribution system. This is one that does satellite and uh, terrestrial and radio and all kinds of other stuff. And uh, if you look at those two metal bars there at the top, with the various wires sort of going through and also a smaller one below, on the end of that there's a connection where the earth bond should be connected. And if we zoom in we can have a closer look at that. And you can see it's got a little earth symbol next to that. It says safety earth, do not disconnect. But the problem is that no one's actually connected this to the earth. They've just left it just sitting there, so although it connects all of the wires, the outer coverings together, there's no earth connection there whatsoever. And the same with the bottom bar, the shorter one, again, nothing connected there at all. So uh, again, these had to be installed. This is the same installation as that one with the large cabinet on the ground floor. You can see the gas pipes are going to the right there. Here's another moderately uh, old installation. Um, we can see at the bottom there the uh, fuse or cutout there, and the wires into the electricity meter. And again, we've got several uh, different fuse boxes here. That brown one at the top is probably the original, although someone's refitted those uh, push button circuit breakers in it at a later date. And then on the left side, we've got a smaller white one with the push button circuit breakers in it. And above that, we've got a plastic unit, which of course is for a shower, as it says on there. Now, the white plastic one, the uh, thing itself is not particularly well fixed because, as you can see, it overlaps that uh, wooden board at the bottom, and it was actually sort of screwed into the board and not particularly well into the wall, so it wasn't uh, properly securely fixed. And another thing about that particular one, if I actually zoom in there, you can see the three circuit breakers there. We've got a red, a white, and a green one. Now the problem here is that these things here are generally only rated to about 40 amps or maybe 60 amps in total. That red one is a 30 amp, and that green one is actually a 45, and that is actually what's supplying the shower thing with, above, which is in fact just an RCD. So when the shower's on at 45 and the other circuits are also moderately powered, there's a good potential of overloading the switch in this older type consumer unit. And in reality, these older ones were never designed to have the 45 amp circuit breakers installed in them. So that again should not be installed in there, as this entire unit is not actually designed for them. The maximum on those Wilex ones was a 30 amp device, and certainly not the 45. 
Here's another Wilex uh, consumer unit, front has been removed, and again we've got those push button breakers installed in there. Now if you have a look in here you may notice there's a distinct lack of any earthing wires. You've got a few on the left there, one of which is the main one coming in from somewhere, or the bonding or something. And then we've just got a couple of other thin ones which go out uh, on that bit of twinning earth towards the top. Now you may imagine that there's no earth connection here, but in reality what type of wire we've got here is the metal clad stuff, or the NIMS or whatever. And the earth connection is actually via the metal case of this unit. And you can see at the bottom there the brass glands coming in, securely screwed onto the metal frame. And also two additional ones over on the right. So though at first glance it might appear that all of the earth wires are missing, of course they're not, because they're actually connected by virtue of those brass glands on the metal case itself. So though this is actually uh, looks like a lot of stuff missing, Actually, in fact, it's uh, perfectly fine. It's just a question of identifying the type of wiring that's being used.